Um, so let me introduce Dr. Arshad Kanani, who is um, a vitreoretinal specialist. Um, he works here in Reno at Sierra Eye Associates. Um, did his training in Texas before uh, coming to Reno, and he's been my go-to guy for uh, patients with diabetic retinopathy since uh, since as long as I can remember being here. So it is um, my pleasure to to introduce him to you. It's been a couple of years, I think, since oh, we yeah. did this, right? Yeah. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to him, and then we will loop back and finish up our cases. Great, thank you. Yeah, yes. thank you so much. Uh, exciting to be here. Uh, as usual, I think it was two or three years ago we did this, and a few things have changed uh, since that time. I mean, the basic management has stayed the same, but there's some new guidelines that came out uh, this year by ADA to manage uh, or to screen a diabetic retinopathy patient. One of my good friends, Charlie Wyckoff, actually was – one of the authors on that uh, paper is based out of Houston. So we'll review some basic things um, about diabetic retinopathy. Please feel free to ask any questions. If you have no question, it's a dumb question. By the way, if you have any uh, question related to my presentation or in general about eye exams or anything you do, please do let me know. Um, so just the anatomy. Basically, first we're going to talk about anatomy and then we're going to talk a little bit about guidelines and screening, and then we'll talk about some pathology. And there's going to be a lot of pictures. Uh, you know, Evan is too smart to think about his T3, T4. I'm more like a visual guy, so that's why <laughs> I became an ophthalmologist, because I like to see things. Uh, I don't have the brain cells to process all those uh, lab results you guys are talking about. So, you know, when you look at uh, this picture, this is the right eye. So. Always when you have a photo, you always worry whether it's the right eye or the left eye. So, you know, there's an acronym MOM, M-O-O-M. So macula on the left side, optic nerve, optic nerve macula. So you start, you know, either eye, if you start on the macula, either on the left side is the right eye. If it's on the right side, it's the left eye. So that's how I remember So fovea is the central vision part of the eye. Um, Optic nerve head, obviously, you can see that, and you know, you check that for papilledema and other things in your clinic. You know, with, with the direct ophthalmoscope, I think the most important thing you can rule out is mainly, mainly papilledema. You know, when I was in training, I did an internship in internal medicine, and the attendees always saw the papilledema. I never saw it, but we always <laughs> pretended, oh, yeah, I agree. And then, you know, it's like, well, there's no papilledema. <laughs> so, so a lot of times it's very hard to uh, look through that direct scope uh, because the patients are not dilated yet. So one trick for medical students is obviously to put some dilating drops, have some, you know, short-acting phenylephrine or tropicamide handy and just put a few drops in and they really have no contraindication even in patients with hypertension or pregnancy and you can really get a much better exam if you dilate the eye. Um, so if you look at the circulation here, you have... Can you point with this? Uh, you can. You can, you can you want to view the screen? All right there. Okay, perfect. So you can see the, the retinal veins uh, coming out. The retinal veins are a little bit bigger than the arteries. So that's the trick is like, which one is vein, which one is artery. You can see the arteries are, uh, you know, the diameter is smaller and you can see kind of the sheeting in there and that's the way. And so really, I mean, it's very hard uh, you know, unless you're a doctor class, you can see retinopathy with your track scope. I, I really could. So that's why, you know, in clinic, we obviously dilate these patients. So again, the orientation, so I said mom, macula, optic nerve, optic nerve, macula. So you can kind of see OD is the right eye, OS is the left eye. Um, and you can see, you know, the vessels coming out. And then you get into the peripheral retina, which is very hard uh, to examine, uh, you know, just so basically this is probably what you can see if you really have a very good exam and if you dilate the patients, you know, you can get really much better exam. And there's some panoptic scopes. I don't know if the medical students are using that now. They give you a little bit bigger view. They kind I, of started, sit. I started using it about yes. three or four years ago and it was changed my whole experience. Maybe. Yeah, it's it's much better. But again, you know, we are we do indirect ophthalmoscope in clinic, which we get a much better view. Uh, but yeah, you know, for screening, I think panoptic or regular scope is good as long as you have a good patient. Layers of the retina, I won't bore you with it, but basically, 
this is the inner retina and then it goes all the way down. And now we have imaging that we can actually see each layer of the retina in our clinic using what's called OCT. So we know about rods and cones, just keeping it simple. Rods are in periphery used for dim light. Cones are mostly in the center for color and high resolution visual acuity. There's three different kinds of cones, uh, red, green, and blue. So diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness uh, between age 20 and 65 years. And remember, you will not go blind if you get your exams done. And I'm surprised even patients who have insurance, who live and who are educated, they actually end up getting, running into trouble because they don't go to their screening visits. So if you get a retinopathy, we watch it. If you get into uh, you know, trouble, we can actually treat it and save the patients from going blind. So you know, the initially we call it background or non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy where you get the hemorrhages. Uh, cotton wool spots can come from retinopathy or mostly from hypertension. Those are little nerve fiber layer infarcts uh, in there. And then um, you, know, you get proliferative stage where you grow abnormal blood vessels. So when I think of diabetes, I think of diabetes as a disease of blood vessels. So I tell the patient first time I see them is, your blood vessels are getting damaged in your feet. You know, they usually have, all of them have neuropathy by the time they have uh, retinopathy, then they, they go into, uh, you know, nephropathy, the heart disease and whatnot. So I tell them, your retina is running out of blood, your vessels are getting damaged, and we see signs of hemorrhaging. And after the hemorrhages are gone, you know, or, or get worse, you get leakage. And then you get proliferative disease where you get abnormal blood vessels growing into the vitreous, and then they bleed, and then that's how they go blind. So this perception that, hey, I'm going to go blind anyways because I, I have diabetes, obviously, is not true. We have, we have mutual patients that have been diabetic for 40 years and they have no retinopathy. And then we have patients who just got diagnosed a year ago, they're blind. So really, screening is the number one thing. Getting them to go to their screening exam and if there is any pathology, we'll be able to uh, treat that in advance. Duration correlates with retinopathy and obviously we classify the disease disease that we'll talk about. These are some recent numbers. So as of 2013, 382 million people in the world have uh, diabetes. I don't know, you agree with those numbers close enough? Seems like 382 million in Reno. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, by two, 2035, estimated to be 592 million. And obviously duration of diabetes correlates with retinopathy. 84 to 90 percent of diabetic retinopathy with a duration of 10, 10 to 15 years. So if somebody comes in and their retinopathy, they say, I just got diagnosed with diabetes, I usually say, well, you've been diabetic for a long time. Uh, you just didn't know about it. 28.5 um, percent of patients above 40 years of age with diabetic have DR. That's a big number. So a quarter, quarter of your patients uh, will have diabetes uh, if they're above 40. And 13.6% of those patients have diabetic macular edema, which causes you know, vision loss. So those are big numbers when you're looking at population in general. And, and you know, when I moved from Dallas, we had a lot of bad diabetics and I came to Reno, I thought it's gonna be uh, you know, much less, but I, on a daily basis, I see tractional retinal detachment in 20 year old, 30 year old who are blind from it. We have to do surgery to save whatever we can. So again, it's a big, Big epidemic, even as Ellen said in Reno, because we have so many patients here, even though they have insurance, they still have not gone to, and gotten their eye exam. And, and how many times they'll come in and say, yeah, my PCP wanted me to do it, and I just didn't have time, and I delayed it for five years. And then they come in with diabetic macular edema on their first exam or tractional detachment. The other big number is controlling the A1C. I'm surprised that most of my diabetic patients in Reno actually know their A1C. We ask them, hey, what was your A1C? And most of them will remember it was seven something or eight something. And, you know, our goal obviously um, uh, lower the better. You know, if I can get close to 6.5 or so or six, I'm happy. But, you know, on a daily basis, again, we have patients with A1C of 14 and 15. And they say, well, I'm doing my best and then you know, they have a big donut in their hand and a Coke can. So, so, you know, we, first time I see the patient, I really scare them in terms of the eye and obviously the whole body. I say, this is something we can see in your eye. I show them the images and then this is what's happening in your kidneys, probably in your heart, in your brain, in your, you know, feet, everywhere. You just 
can't see it and this is how it looks. So imagine that in your heart, you're probably gonna have a heart attack or a stroke. So we talk to them in detail, but again, you know, communicating with the PCP is a goal uh, because, uh, you know, you are the ones who are actually managing the overall uh, disease and, you know, we can, we, we try to be involved, but again, the focus obviously is to try to, uh, you know, prevent vision loss. And sometimes I've seen that once they start treatments for diabetic macular edema or retinopathy, which we'll talk about, their sugars get better because they get really, really scared. Uh, um, but the unfortunate part is that the compliance rate um, for diabetics to come to retina clinic is very poor because there are so many appointments. They tend to be working. They tend to be younger. They tend to have commercial insurances with big copays. And, and no matter how we do, I have enough patients who will just disappear for six months or a year and then come back with a hemorrhage and be blind with it. So, so compliance is always an issue, uh, but we do our best to keep them on track. And if they come for other appointments and undergo treatment, most of them do not go blind. So these are the new screening guidelines um, by American Diabetic uh, Association. Uh, so basically, screening by dilated eye exam uh, should begin within five years after onset of type 1 di diabetes. So type 1 diabetic within five years, but type 2 diabetes, just for the reasons I mentioned, sometimes they have it much longer and they don't know it. It should happen at the time of diagnosis. For patients with either type of diabetes, if there's no evidence of retinopathy, follow-up can be scheduled about every two years. So this was a change uh, uh, from the old guidelines that you have to go in every year for it. And I always wondered, hey, if they don't have any, any retinopathy, it's very hard to just suddenly get it in one, one year. So I think it's good to know that, hey, you can tell the patient, go for your exam, and if it's all nice and clean, you probably don't have to go back uh, for, for two years. If there is any retinopathy, obviously, then we decide based on the extent of retinopathy, how often a patient needs to be seen. If it's just mild, non-proliferative retinopathy, maybe nine to 12 months. If it's moderate or severe, maybe six months or three months, depending on what you plan to do with them. And this is very interesting about uh, women with pre-existing diabetes who are planning pregnancy should be screened prior to becoming pregnant, or if that doesn't occur, during the first trimester because I've seen, I remember from my training, there was a young girl who got pregnant and boy, she went from nothing to proliferative diabetic retinopathy and we had to do a lot of lasers and whatnot to, to make sure she doesn't go blind. So, so that's another key point from this guideline is that if you have somebody who, have di who has diabetes and who wants to get pregnant, please uh, kind of counsel them in advance and we'll have to watch your eyes carefully and, they, and usually you follow them every trimester if they are high risk so because if they go proliferative you can actually uh, treat them so that they don't go blind so correlation of a1c uh, you know it basically higher the a1c is it correlates uh, with uh, higher risk of retinopathy so uh, primary care physicians you know goal is to really control the sugars and keep that A1C as low as possible. I tell my patients that, hey, you're coming in and you're getting lasers or injections in your eye. If you control your A1C and lower it down, you may be able to stop that. A lot of times, it's pretty obvious that patients who really take care of their A1Cs and blood sugars, they actually do very well long term. They don't have to be on treatment for a very long time. On the flip side, there are patients no matter what you do, they keep getting worse because they're not controlling their underlying diabetes. So background diabetic retinopathy or non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we have mild, uh, moderate, severe, and very severe. These are dot and blot hemorrhages right here. These are some exudates. So what happens is the blood vessels get damaged and you get what's called microaneurysms and then they leak protein into the retina. So this was right here, this patient's vision will be much worse. So this is a cotton wool spot. Uh, it's, again, it's usually from hypertension, but you can see it from diabetes. It usually goes away if you control your um, blood pressure and sugars. Uh, the hemorrhages usually stay, they, they don't really regress. Um, there's some new coming treatments to stop and reverse the retinopathy, which we'll talk about later. The exudates will go away, it will take several months. 
as long as you can figure out which aneurysm is leaking and you can treat it either with an injection or, or with a laser. Then you get what's called the neovascularization. So if you look in somebody's eye and the nerve looks really, really like this, these are abnormal vessels growing into the vitreous. So now they have proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is a fluorescein angiogram, which is shining up those abnormal vessels here and also shining up some microaneurysms here in the macula. So what happens is these proliferative vessels grow into the vitreous and then they start to bleed. So they'll bleed under the vitreous or into the vitreous and patients will just go blind. And, and I'm surprised most, a lot of time patients will not come in when they have that because the other eye is fine. And then over time they get membrane formation on top and the retina gets pulled and then that's how they go blind from this disease. So if I could just interject, so I think it's important on this picture to recognize that although you're looking at a two-dimensional image and those new vessels look as if they're kind of pancake flat, right? they're actually, it's a three-dimensional event, so that those vessels are growing actually towards you. When you're looking in the eye, they're extending upwards from the surface of the retina. Right. It's almost like a little palm tree, you know, of exactly. vessels. That's why they're so fragile. Absolutely, and then they tend to bleed uh, very quickly. Another question. Yes. Another question here. Yes. On your screen. So the question is: We have an optometrist in town. Is it okay for optometrists to do dilated diabetic eye screening, or must I refer to out-of-town ophthalmologists? No, I think is? I think you know, as long as the optometrist is dilating the patient, they should be able to uh, do the screening for you. And again. The ophthalmologists or the retinal specialists usually get involved when things start to go in the wrong direction with diabetic macular edema and proliferative diabetic retinopathy. That being said, you know, going forward, hopefully we have some treatments to, that as long as, as soon as you have retinopathy, you can stop or reverse it. Currently, we are kind of putting a patch on the wound. We don't have anything, uh, you know, for the eye to stop the disease from getting worse other than giving them injections or lasers. But absolutely, I think it's easy enough exam for an optometrist to dilate the patient and do it. Just make sure a patient gets dilated. A lot of these patients who go to optometrists will just say, oh yeah, I got my glasses and they don't get dilated. So a dilated eye exam is crucial. With fundus photography? Uh, photography is actually a not necessary okay. exam would be the key. So if you don't, you know, a lot of these people are doing remote. I know Renown is doing some remote uh, photos. I think that's great if you don't have a practitioner in town. A lot of these patients will go in and get photos and get an exam. Right. <laughs> and the question is, what's the point? Some of it becomes a business pattern right, right, for, right. For, for other things. But, but I usually don't do any photos on my patients unless, uh, you know, I'm doing a fluorescein angiogram or something. Okay. You can usually, you know, grade the retinopathy based on your exam. But if you don't have a practitioner and you have some remote facility to do photos, absolutely. Main thing is that they get their exam done. You know, it doesn't matter how somebody needs to look at their fungus. So proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is somebody with what's called a pre-retinal hemorrhage. The way you say it's a pre-retinal hemorrhage, you can't see the underlining vessels. So in younger patients with diabetes, this happens quite a bit because their vitreous is stuck very tightly to the retina. So these blood vessels will just bleed and the blood will get stuck uh, between the vitreous and um, the retina. And what happens is this causes fibrosis and then starts pulling. So if this was right here, patient would be completely blind. They'll come in and say, hey, I can't see anything. I have a big black spot. And most of that becomes surgical because since their vitreous is so tightly adherent to the retina, the blood cannot get into the vitreous, and then you have to go surgically and you have to remove the blood and clean it out. And these are some exudates, so this is diabetic macular edema. There's some microaneurysms here, and this is all the protein leaking. So this person, you know, obviously needs to be treated ASAP. And what I've seen is the younger the patient, better the response to treatment, whether it's laser or intravitreal injections, they're very ischemic, so if you try to cut the ischemia down, I think they do very well. So again, sooner the better to uh, treat this patient. This is how patients go blind, and we have a cool surgical video at the end, but basically they get these fibrous bands from bleeding, 
and you can see this is a fibrous uh, band and what happens is it sits on top of the macula and pulls everything. Then they get what's called tractional retinal detachment and what we need to do is we need to go in and trim and remove these membranes but a lot of time the damage is already done to the center so even if you do surgery and the anatomy looks much better their vision is still uh, in nowhere close to perfect so again if they came in on time we would avoid all these things uh, if we can treat them early macular edema so as i was talking about this is lipids right here it's swelling the retina it's hard to see it's a 2d photo there is an old definition of clinically significant macular edema. You don't need to worry about it. When you see our nose, now we call it diabetic macular edema. So even if it was not close to the center, we'll call it diabetic macular edema. Now, the treatments have changed. Before, we just had laser to treat all these areas, and patients will lose some vision because of the burning of the retina. Now, if it's central involving macular edema, we give them intravitreal injections which we'll talk about to stop the leakage. So this is somebody who's a bad diabetic. Their vision is probably legally blind range, 2200, 2400. You can see just exudates everywhere. And this is from all these vessels that are damaged right all around the macula and the protein is actually being leaked into, into the macula. So the protein comes after just fluid. First you'll just have uh, serous fluid leaking in the retina and if it's not controlled then you get more protein leakage based on the damage. So this is somebody even if you will treat you'll probably not end up with good vision because by the time they have got in here they have a lot of damage all around their macula. Cotton wool spots as we talked about earlier this is somebody who looks like more like hypertensive retinopathy you can see the cotton wool spots you can see these hemorrhages that go linear and these are called nerve fiber layer hemorrhages. So the nerve fiber layer on the retina goes like this. You can see these hemorrhages in linear direction. So this is somebody I would worry a lot about hypertension. And luckily, all of this will resolve if they control their blood pressure. So, so again, all these findings in the eye, hypertensive retinopathy can be very acute. But once you control the, the blood pressure over three to six months, all of these findings can resolve. Apolytic one. Yeah, so I would call it optic nerve edema. Okay. So the difference between optic nerve edema and papilledema is that optic nerve edema can happen because of diabetes, because of hypertension, because of viral infection. Papilledema, we usually call it that there is an intracranial uh, thing that's happening that's causing the optic nerve to be swollen. So if you have hypertensive retinopathy, you will get that. Um, so the, so the, the difference between Papilledema and optic nerve edema, the other thing you see these vessels right here, in papilledema they're gonna be all blunted. Um, in this case, so I would agree, you know, they're kind of interchangeable at time, but I would call that optic nerve edema. And you may see that in your clinic. And obviously sometimes it's hard to distinguish. So if you see somebody like that, they need an urgent referral to make sure there's no intracranial lesion causing it. So, we use fluorescein angiography, we put a dye um, uh, intravenous and then it goes to their eye and we take uh, pictures. You saw some of those pictures earlier. The technology is getting better and better. Now we can get good peripheral images and a lot of the ischemia will start in peripheral retina and we can catch a proliferative disease early to treat it um, these days. So this is a fluorescein angiogram. Um, uh, early phase and then late phase so you can see the dye is going into the vessels there's something going on right there and then over time you can see there's a leak right there so this is clinically significant macular edema is very close to the center and this patient probably needs intravitreal injections to control the leakage so if you have a patient coming in they put a dye and I came I became all yellow and I was being fluorescent mm -hmm. this is what they had done OCT, this is, uh, this is an older image, but OCT is showing the layers of the retina. This is the foveal contour here. So in somebody with diabetic macular edema, it will be swollen. So really OCT has been the go-to test now. We're doing less and less flourishing angiogram because we can see even very small cyst or leakage in it. So this is somebody with macular edema. You can see all the protein and, and serous fluid has leaked into the center. So the light is hitting the center and the vision is gonna be blurry because 
is not getting to the cells at the bottom. So older treatment, we still do it sometimes uh, if, the, if the leakage is not into the center. What we do is we take a little laser and we burn these microaneurysms all around. And then over time, this leakage will, will go away because the, ret the RPE cells of the retina will start absorbing the fluid. Then retinal photocoagulation, we still do quite a bit of this because the diabetics tend to be unreliable uh, most of the time and they don't follow up. Um, these are burns that you perform on the peripheral retina. So they have ischemia and they grow those NVD or neovascular uh, vessels that we saw earlier here or in the retina and we burn all the ischemic retina so that those vessels go away so they don't bleed anymore. So obviously this is the macula. The, you're using it 90% or 95% of the time, but you also use your peripheral retina. So once you have this laser, um, you are going to lose some peripheral vision. This is an older photo, so now we're not doing as tight laser um, as we used to because, you know, the technology is much better. But again, they will lose some peripheral vision. They may say, hey, I had laser surgery in my eye, and it could be the focal laser we talked about for the center, which does not hurt. This one hurts. If they say, oh, my God, my eye hurt really, really bad during the laser procedure, they probably had these pan retinal photocoagulation. Usually we have to do it in one or two sessions. Now the intravitreal injections, FDA just approved for any kind of retinopathy. So you can do the injections in the eye every, it's every month, but you can do it every two or three months if you're a reliable patient and you can avoid the laser. So if somebody is a pilot or a truck driver, they don't want to lose their peripheral vision. This also affects their pupils uh, because what happens is um, the nerves are coming horizontally and vertically and you're doing the laser so they may also have a difficult time for light adaptation going from dark to light because their pupil doesn't really move too much because of the laser. So these are the intravitreal injections. I now say that retinal specialists are like human syringes. Every other patient in our clinic gets an injection whether it's macular degeneration, diabetes, retinal vein occlusion and if you don't know what it is we still inject so, 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 so what we do is we do tons of these. Um, these are done under lo local to or topical anesthetic. We numb the area with some, uh, you know, subclinding type of lidocaine or drops or jelly. Everybody has a different approach. We inject the needle at what's called pars plena, which is the area there is no retina. So the retina about starts six millimeter behind what we call the limbus right here. So this is the area where we do all the surgery from, and this is the area where we inject things in the eye without causing, uh, you know, too many trauma. I have patients who have been getting it for, you know, eight years I've been here. So these are really, really safe, but again, there's always a risk of infection with anything sticking uh, in the eye. Luckily, the rate is very low. It's at uh, three to 5,000. Um, so very, very low, but we have to be careful to keep the lashes away. So this is a speculum we're using and the injection is uh, going into the eye. So if I have a reliable diabetic with proliferative disease, um, so proliferative disease we, we treat with pan retinal laser, as I said, if they don't want to lose their peripheral vision, most of the time they don't even notice it because that, that area is dead already from ischemia. But if they will lose some, and if they don't want to do it, and they're reliable, they really want to keep their peripheral vision, then they'll have to commit to getting these injections every one to two or three months um, so that they can not have progression of their disease. If they have diabetic macular edema in the center, this is the go-to therapy, and we'll talk a little bit about it. So these are um, the agents we use in our clinic. Kenalog is an old uh, steroid, and we didn't have any other treatment if you look at the Kenalog box, it says do not inject in the eye. So retina guys do a lot of off-label treatments uh, because we are kind of desperate and anything works. We try to use it. Macrogen was an old treatment. It's now gone. It's not available uh, because it really didn't work. Avastin is, so if you hear the word Avastin, it was actually a colon cancer medication uh, that was made, that's made by Genentech. So it's a big uh, big deal is also used in breast cancer and because we were so desperate especially with macular degeneration uh, because lasers really didn't work in that disease other than you know blinding the patient because the leakage is in the center 
people start injecting in the eye and they saw great results in terms of stopping the leakage. So all, these drugs, these three are what's called anti-VEGF agents or these four. So what happens is you get ischemia in your retina and so body secretes vascular endothelial growth factor to grow new vessels. But as we saw, those new vessels are abnormal. And also the VEGF tend to leakage into the retina. So these drugs actually block that VEGF and really have revolutionized how we treat our patients. You know, macular degeneration is the number one cause of blindness in this country, about 65. There's a paper out after the advent of these, overall in the world, 75% blindness had been cut because of these injections. But unfortunately, it's not something that you do once. You have to get it every month or every other month based on your disease. So we don't really have a cure. Uh, we just have a treatment to stabilize their vision. Lucentis was the first FDA-approved uh, drug for macular degeneration and also for diabetes. It's basically a Vastin, but it's a small fragment. The reason they made Lucentis was that it's a, not a full antibody. The idea was that anything you inject in the eye goes to your blood circulation. So, so Lucentis was a smaller mo molecule, and that's why it didn't recycle in your body and it didn't stay in your system more than two hours. Um, ILEA was the newest one approved in 2011 for macular degeneration. So in all of these words you see, I just want to mention it so that you know that these are all injected in the eye. Ozerdex is a dexamethasone implant. So we are really not injecting steroids. Some of these diabetics will not respond to just the anti-VEGF agents. So you have to put steroids in the eye. Obviously, you try to avoid steroids, especially in young patients, because uh, they end up in cataract formation and also 30% risk of intraocular pressure spike. So these are the second line agent and Illumian came out about two to three years ago. It's a three year implant. So actually you inject this and it can last for up to three years. The problem is the efficacy is not as good as all the other agents. So it can more become like a chronic therapy for baseline um, you know, control. So this is what I was talking about, about VEGF is, you know, it's what's triggering all these things in our goal is to inhibit the VEGF and stop the abnormal vessels. So this is somebody uh, who had advanced PDR. This is all membrane formation. You can see actually their optic nerve is right here and this is all covered with scar tissue. So you go in surgically to remove all this, but again, the damage underneath uh, may be the problem, but you can maybe get this patient from seeing count fingers to maybe 2,400. So, in retina, you know, what we do is our goal is to save whatever we can. And that's why a lot of ophthalmologists don't go into retina because it can be frustrating at times. It's like managing diabetes, mm -hmm. you know. You do your best and sometimes still it's not, uh, you know, it's patient dependent at times too. So, so it can be challenging, but, uh, you know, we do our best to. So, again, the goal is to get these patients early for their screening and treatment. And this is just a cool video I wanted to show. Um, right after this. So this is not the same patient, but patient underwent surgery to remove all the membranes. And I just put this video that I did the surgery a few, a uh, few months ago. So you can see this is, this was a young patient with diabetes. There's some lasers in the periphery, but the center is all covered uh, with membranes. And what we do is these are the instruments we put in the eye. This is called a vitrector. And there's a light bulb. So again, we are going through those, that bar splint I talk about where we go do the injections. And we're actually, now the instruments are so good that these, there's a new retractor that's why I made the video. This has a bevel edge. And what we can do is we can actually slice and go under these membranes and, and remove them. But again, this is what's called a macula involving tractional retinal detachment. So, you know, even after fixing it, the patient's vision improved, but not significantly because of the underlying ischemic damage. But, um, so that's all the retina here. I keep stopping. And this is a macula right there, so you have to be really gentle peeling this off that you don't want to tear the retina. A lot of these cases you will have tears, but that's not a big deal. You can treat them with laser and put either a gas uh, fill or an oil fill in the eye to stop a detachment. But these are the membranes that form when they keep bleeding. And 
the vitreous, the posterior hyaloid, we call it, which is the posterior edge of the vitreous. So this is somebody who had that hemorrhage right in the center, didn't come in on time, and they end up, uh, you know, coming up with these membranes. So I usually make sure I don't have my coffee. No, just <laughs> <laughs> so no robots for this surgery? Uh, no robots. They're actually, they're working in Belgium, but the problem is, is the pathology is, is so widespread and it's not the same thing on every patient. It's mm -hmm. very hard to train a robot to mm -hmm. do it. And, you know, I think I may need a robot once I turn 60, but uh, <laughs> at this point, I think I'm okay. Uh, but they're working on it. But you can see that we are, so now you can see the optic nerve. And, and the goal is to remove this traction because the tr if you leave the traction, you can end up with tear. So this is after all the removal. Uh, you, I did the laser and now putting some gas in the eye. There's a little hole in the retina there underneath. So. Crazy. Any questions? That that's a that thing you just showed us is amazing. What what type of vision correction resulted from that approximately? So, so I think the patient went from seeing just shadows to about twenty four hundred. So they're still in the legally blind range, but now they can see instead of just being shadows, they can see kind of this room here or a little bit. So, you know, our goal is, that vision is very functional. And, you know, our goal is to say whatever we can. But when we, we all come as a team here to pre pre prevent that from happening. And unfortunately, it happens on a daily basis in our clinic. But that's where the first time you see the diabetic, that's where the disease education comes into play. If this could have been all avoided, patient would be much better if we caught him when they went proliferative and just do the laser and we're done. Other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to, yes. yes. So, uh, we have here at Wells, we have the ability to do our uh, iris, which is a retina screening. Um, and we do it at, at least annually, but not, you know, every six months if it's determined, you know, depending on what the read is, because it's read by an outside um, uh, specialist. Um, and sometimes, you know, typically what we do is we'll do it annually and then if it's abnormal, we send them to someone locally. I know that the recommendations now are every two years, but I feel like in our patient population annually is still probably most appropriate because most of our diabetics are, have adherence issues with their regimen. What would you, does that seem appropriate? Well, I think the, the problem is the recommendation are for dilated eye exam. So if you're just sending the photos out, dilate before the retina scan. Photos, yes. But a lot of time, um, the retina scan, the, the problem, what uh, system are you using in terms of photos? Is it iris? Okay. Is what it's called? I, I'm familiar with the iris registry. That's by AAO, but I'm not familiar with the, the iris system. So it depends how wide your photos go. That's why exam is crucial because a lot of time the disease will start in the periphery. And these cameras... And we, we have a struggle every day. I mean, even if we have certified photographers, we just can't get the photos that we want. So I think if you're doing the photos, it's not a bad idea to be more aggressive, maybe every six months or every year at minimum, you know, because it, it cannot replace the exam, but it's a good supplement. So if you don't have the manpower to do the good fundus dilated exam, then I would at least do photos every year, even though you don't see the pathology because there's clearly some peripheral pathology that can be missed on those photos. I'm gonna jump in for one second. There was a paper in the New England Journal about four weeks ago um, from the, uh, the EDIC group, the, the folks who followed the DCCT, and what they actually looked at were individualizing uh, screening regimens based on duration of disease and A1C. And there was, so there was some interest in that, and then there was some, some pushback. There was an editorial that said, you know, that's great, but, you know, this is so important, maybe we shouldn't relax our vigilance because catching this disease early is just too important. So, if anybody wants to check that, it was, a, it was an interesting article and editorial. No, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's, I remember you, sometimes you say, go come back in two and they'll come back in five. Right. That's the, that's the problem <laughs> is the reliability is an issue with diabetics. So, so why, you know, the guidelines are something we can use, but again, you have to look at the patient. If their A1C is 14, 
and there are no retinopathy this year. I mean, this is somebody who was exactly it. sooner than later. The other thing is artificial intelligence. You know, there was a paper out uh, a few months ago, and I forget which journal it was. They were actually using computers to to look at these photos and about seventy five thousand photos that look at, and the computer was able to pick uh, you know retinopathy in about eighty five to ninety percent of the yeah. cases. So that may be the way to the future because you know it's just the lack of manpower and this disease is exploding that there's no way everybody can get their dilated eye exam when they're supposed to. Okay, thank you so no, very much. You're welcome. Uh,